Welcome. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of the Analytics at Wharton AI at Wharton podcast series. We're doing a series here on artificial intelligence and today's episode is looking to be extremely exciting. I'm happy to be joined today by two of my colleagues. Uh, the first is Zab Elizabeth Johnson, who's the Executive Director and Senior Fellow of the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative, and my colleague, Michael Platt, who, this will take a minute, listeners, who's the both the Faculty Director of the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative. He's the James S. Reapy Prof Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor. He's in my home department of marketing. He's also in the Department of Neuroscience in the Perlman School of Medicine, and he's also in the Psychology Department in the School of Ar Arts and Sciences. So Michael and Zab, welcome to our podcast. Thanks for having yeah, us, thanks, Eric. Eric. It's great to be here. Well, why don't we start with the basics? I know, Zab, I'll start with you. Um, for our listeners that don't know, of course, they can go to your website and see all about it. But what is the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative? And then we'll get into what it has to do with our episode today, AI and Neuroscience. Great. Uh, so the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative is a research center under analytics at Wharton here at the Wharton School. Um, and really what we're doing is to help uh, businesses, individuals, uh, and society writ large understand why neuroscience might impact their lives. Um, so, so we're working um, at, at in, on all different levels, uh, both education, of course, here we are at the University of Pennsylvania, um, trying to lead the charge in, in, in encouraging curiosity um, and engagement in the neurosciences writ large. We're not trying to change business students into neuroscientists, but we want them to be aware um, of, of what the power of, of looking under the hood is um, at brain activity itself. And, uh, and then we have research, active research, an active research portfolio. A lot of times we do that in, in conjunction with companies um, to answer and, uh, and think about questions that haven't yet had an academic and a practice partnership um, to do bigger and, and better things out in the wild. Um, and of course, engagement is like our third, uh, really our third pillar. It's, um, it's encouraging people to think very broadly about this three pound organ that they have in their inside their heads um, and to think about how that might um, impact their, their lives, their own individual work and, um, and how they live their lives. So, Michael, maybe a question for you. I've always said that, you know, people ask me what I do for a living, and I say, oh, I'm a professor, I'm a statistician, but I really say I'm a professional data chaser. I chase interesting forms of data. Could you tell us, since you and I are the same age, we've been in academia the same basic amount of time, how has technology changed the field of neuroscience? Because, you know, when I was a young researcher, you had to put people over in an fMRI machine, if those even existed. You'll even tell me if those existed 30 years ago. We had to put people in an fMRI to get brain activity. How has technology yeah. just changed even yeah. that aspect yeah, of what a, you do? <clears throat> it's a great question. And I think that what what's interesting from the perspective of neuroscience is the kinds of data that we get, right? So it's... It's not directly observable data. It's not data that people can um, verbally express typically because it's like we don't have good access to what's going on in our heads. And, and just the question, just by being asked, that changes uh, our appreciation of that. Uh, technology in neuroscience is bewildering now. So it is just every year, every day, just exploding the, the myriad ways in which we can measure and actually manipulate um, brain structure and brain function the vast majority of those technologies are not really readily applied to humans because they would involve, you know, putting something in your head. Now, that said, there's an active race in the private sector even right now, you know, Neuralink being, you know, one amongst many companies that is <clears throat> creating and building implants with a vision that someday, you know, maybe all of us will be uh, perfectly happy to have uh, some sort of technology within our heads that could allow us to communicate with um, machines, computer, com communicate, excuse me, with computers, even communicate with each other. But uh, fMRI still exists, uh, and it's been around for some 40 years, but um, it is still a really great tool for peering deep into the brain. Uh, but, you know, it's expensive, it's cumbersome, it's not very scalable. You can't put it on a consumer's head while they're walking around, you know, shopping at Walmart or on your employee's head while they're, you know, while they're at work. So, uh, so we reserve it for specific kinds of, of studies, like to, to test hypotheses about, you know, why did somebody make a risk-averse decision versus not. It provides kind of a foundation that we try to do uh, from there is to use that as a springboard for applying other more scalable technologies um, that can be done, you know, with many more people in a lighter weight, cheaper kind of fashion that's more 
uh, more useful for business, right? And I think that's where we're in a really exciting place in the last decade, especially the last couple of years, which is the development of very high, uh, high signal quality wearable neurotechnology. And so there's a whole variety of, of gizmos that are on the market or coming to market. And, um, and I think, and we'll talk about this some more obviously, but, but yoking that, combining that with advances in AI and machine learning puts us in a position to um, really capitalize on the ability to, you know, to, under, to measure brain activity in the real world you know, at scale, thousands, maybe millions of people uh, in a much wider array of activities than is possible in the laboratory. So that's going to give us incredibly new insights, I believe. So one of the things, as both of you know, that we asked you to do before this episode was to write a set of questions that I could ask you. And this episode is no different. Matter of fact, Zab and I joked before you got here, Michael, I, she joked with me, like, who do you think wrote these questions, us or ChatGPT, which is a perfect segue to my first question. So um, either one of you can answer this. I don't, matter of fact, this is one of those times I'm asking a question where I actually really, really don't know the answer. So what is organic intelligence and how is this different from artificial intelligence? So Zab, I'll start with you. What is, what is organic, artificial? What does that mean to you as someone that's trained in neuroscience? So I think it starts with just thinking about organic matter, right? So, so in general, organic intelligence is used in the domain when it's carbon-based. Um, so that's there, what I have. Yeah, yeah, so that's what you have, oh. the, wet, the wet, gooey stuff that's inside, right? But also all of the animal kingdom has that. Um, so, so you can argue about intelligence, right, and, and different metrics of intelligence, and we can talk about that later. But, but in general, it's, it's this idea that, it, you know, that you have a nervous system that's carbon-based, um, that, that you know, has a certain kind of behavior um, and integrates signals in a certain kind of you know, chemical and electrical um, system that's carbon-based. And I think in opposition to what we classically think of as AI, AI is done in silica, right? Um, I mean, that's the way it has been so far. We'll see um, if, uh, if we start to grow, to, to grow artificially, um, in the lab using wet stuff, um, that might that might change. It might get in it, you know, and, and I think some people would argue that there is already still carbon in, involved. But I think the the sort of root of what people think of as this definition is is based on ha actually having a nervous system rather than not having a nervous system and doing it artificially. And so another interesting question that you guys put down is what are some common traits shared between AI systems in the human brain? So, or let me ask another question. Should people that are building artificial intelligence systems today, do they have a team of neuroscientists working with them? Because in some ways, if one of the goals of artificial intelligence is to mimic human intelligence, shouldn't we actually understand how the human brain works before we try to build systems that are trying to mimic some aspects of that? Well, <clears throat> I think there's several questions here, which is what are the goals of AI, like an AI researcher? So one might be to mimic the properties of human nervous systems, but maybe we can do it in a different way. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Maybe we can even go beyond the capabilities of human uh, intelligence. So I think that there are, there are a number of different um, commonalities between the two. So and, and it's kind of interesting when you think historically about where some of the basic algorithms and like machine learning, like reinforcement learning came from, they actually had an origin in psychology and in neuroscience. And we've, it's, so it's kind of been, you know, this really interesting feedback. Um, in the I never thought about that. Is, would like what Pavlov did with his experiments, Absolutely. would those be considered reinforcement learning? Ab ab that's the origins oh, of, okay. of reinforcement learning. And actually the, you know, the, the, the basic um, reinforcement learning model was really written out here by, um, by a professor in psychology, Bob Ruscorla, back in the 19... Uh, 60s and early 70s. So there's a, you know, Penn has a really, I think, important part in the history of the development of, of AI. But um, it's for a long time, people thought that there, I think that um, when we looked at human brain or an animal brains in general, that yes, reinforcement learning is important for learning to navigate and learning what's good and what's bad, what to approach, what to avoid. But maybe it didn't go much deeper than that. And then there were there's sort of circuits, and this is certainly true, circuits that are have prescribed functions that are sort of built in, if you will, kind of hardwired, and that AI with its, va you know, and the other thing is, is that there's constraints on neural function. Okay, we've got a three pound device in our heads, 86 billion neurons, 100 trillion connections, 
but it's actually pretty limited, honestly, and it's limited by energetic constraints, which I, th I think we'll talk about in a bit. Um, <clears throat> whereas AI, oh, you know, what are the limits? Well, how big is the data warehouse? That you, right. you know, how many servers can you put underneath uh, the hood of ChatGPT? And so, so I think the thought was that, like, oh, that brute force kind of approach, you know, in in AI and machine learning couldn't deliver the kinds of intelligent creative um, kind of thinking that human beings do. And in fact, that is what we're seeing. And now when we look back at human brains, we I think we're starting to rethink that conceptualization, which is like, uh, well, actually our brains have a ton of experience under the hood, right? So evolution, and then from the time you're an infant, right? And you're being bombarded with all this information. And that's a lot of time uh, for that system to kind of learn using similar principles like gradient descent, which is really at the root of AI. And now when we go back and we look at what you might call neurons in, a, you know, in an artificial neural network and real neurons in mm -hmm. a neural network that often have very similar properties, which they seem to have arrived at through processes like gradient descent. Uh, this is Eric Bradlow, Professor of Marketing and Statistics and Vice Dean of Analytics here at the Wharton School. And we're here today in our AI and Neuroscience podcast uh, edition. And I'm here talking to uh, Michael Platt, who's the James S. Reapy Professor of Marketing, Psychology, and Neuroscience, and Zab Johnson, who's the Executive Director of the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative and also a Senior Fellow. So, Zab, let me ask you, um, how is artificial intelligence being used in your field of neuroscience today? Whether it's from the, I always say there's at least two sides to AI. One is the more traditional one, which is as in, you know, images can now be ingested by an engine and data can be now output from a, like for example, you could take a voxelized picture of voxelized blood flow from the brain, jam it into an AI engine and out could shoot a big long vector of stuff. That's kind of the more traditional. The other could be more in the generative AI way. So any thoughts to our listeners about how AI is being used in neuroscience? Yeah, it's being used in so many different ways. And uh, so I'm a visual neuroscientist. And, and I think that some of the beginnings, actually, of the way that, um, that cognitive science, vision science, visual neuroscience were coming together with AI and engineering happened really early. So, so actually, it was oftentimes through the neuroscientists that were thinking about vision, um, how we see or how we can even train machines to see um, that some of the very beginning of these algorithms emerged. Um, and actually, like, you know, I think deep neural nets um, and, and you know, CNNs, for example, like were, were like they, they were an outcropping actually from people in my discipline. Um, and so you know, like I, I remember the early ones like, is that a cat? Right. You know, so you have some picture, an image with a bunch of pixels, and then it's putting it into some neural net, some compression engine, and then it's got a, you know, encoder and a decoder. I, I agree with you. I think vision was probably one of the earliest ones that got people excited. Yeah, and I think one of the really interesting things in that dialogue was it was that you could get to the same you could get to the same answer. You could actually make machines see. Um, but it turned out to be fundamentally different from the way that 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 uh, that the human does, right? And so I think that some of the discoveries that are happening now are how can it inform actually how we understand neuro neural processing? Um, and one of the powers I think of AI is that it's a you know it, it can seek patterns um, and even multiple answers to a single question that seems to you know push on the limit at least of single investigators or you know even you know even teams. Um, and so I think we're about to learn much more. Um, I think some of the most innovative work right now is happening where you can see communities and of, of both AI researchers and neuroscientists back in dialogue with one another, um, some, some recurrency um, in, that, in that conversation. And, you know, I think that I think we're in the very beginnings of, of seeing what the power will be. But I think, um, you know, I think to give you some concrete examples, um, uh, a couple of researchers, uh, uh, Yuki Yasu Kamitani, who's at Kyoto University, and Frank Tong, who's at Vanderbilt University, about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, did some of the, the 
foundational um, work um, to look and see whether you could de decode um, using algorithms um, the information that people were seeing. Um, that was that was sort of the beginning, um, and that was long before we had generative AI. We were just thinking about algorithms and the power of pattern detection. Um, then, you know, quickly after that, um, Jack Gallant and Alex Huth, um, and who Alex is now at the University of Texas Austin, um, and Jack, who is whose work you know, whose lab he was in at the time at UC Berkeley, were thinking about semantic meaning um, and thinking about the kinds of brain activity that came up with semantic meaning, but also um, visuals um, uh, and movie decoding. Um, and like they were starting to, to use algorithms to look at the patterns of brain activity to help decode, you know, from a researcher standpoint, what people had actually seen. Um, and uh, Kamitani then did this really interesting thing where he actually decoded dreams. So like one of the, I think one of the interesting aspects of, of that work is like, you know, telling you something about that maybe people actually have a really hard time reporting, right? Um, or it's impossible to, 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 to report, but another kind of imagination or visualization. So, Michael, let me ask you a follow-up question to what Zab said. So, I tend to be, and maybe this is why I'm not a basic scientist. I'm, well, I'm a scientist. I'm a basic scientist, sort of. Um, I tend to believe things that are of low-dimensional representation, but maybe the world is really complex. So, uh, Zab mentioned something about pattern recognition. How much of, like, the future of what we're going to learn in neuroscience is because we can take this very high-dimensional, or let's call it three-dimensional, time series data— put it into some AI engine, and we're going to notice some 86-dimensional interaction that no human could possibly find. Is the world built that way with 86-dimensional interactions? Or is it like, no, if you understood these, I'll make it up. I'm literally making it up, and you go correct all of my vocabulary. If I if these neurons or voxelized areas, if I put them into the right bracket, then it really is just a three dimensional, four dimensional thing. What are we going to learn from AI? Wow, that's a <laughs> deep, big question. Well, we have Eric, six to eight hours here on <clears throat> this okay, episode. So, uh, so please, well, elaborate. I, you, know, you know, I can talk for a long time. <laughs> I know you can. So, um, oh. I think I have sort of two answers to that. I mean, I think that in on the one hand, in the applied sense. Maybe it doesn't even matter. But what it does allow us to do, and there were three striking examples of this, kind of following what Zeb talked about this year, three major um, discoveries, publications, whatever you want to talk about. So we're just, you're taking this very high-dimensional data and you're reducing it and you're turning it into something useful. So there was one study, um, you know, it was the culmination of decades of work but by a group at Lausanne that basically took a guy who, this gentleman who had a spinal cord uh, injury. He'd been paralyzed for you know a couple of decades. Uh, you take the data out of the brain, you feed it through an algorithm, machine learning algorithm, and now rather than trying to actuate a robotic exoskeleton or something like that, uh, you actually pipe it back into the spinal cord beneath the site of the injury, and now the guy can walk. Yeah, like, I, read, I read that walk. article. I mean, you know, breathtaking. Who knows how it's working, what is really happening? Does it tell you how the brain works? Not necessarily, but it's incredibly useful. Similarly, uh, for work um, out of Eddie Chang's group at, at uh, UCSF, allowing a woman who's been uh, unable to speak for, you know, again, a long time, more than a decade, uh, due to a stroke, to actually have a conversation in real time with her, uh, with her husband. Okay, so, you know, speech is generally taken to be the most important aspect of being a human being. Those are the thing, the parts of the brain you want to avoid um, injuring uh, in any kind of uh, surgery. And now she can actually have a conversation that is meaningful. And then another decoding uh, one that um, kind of building on what Zab talked about. Uh, an fMRI study, and fMRI, let's appreciate, it's not a great technology. It's slow, it's sluggish, it relies on blood flow. So not very precise, right? But, um, but in that study, uh, the scientists were able to uh, decode what a person was reading, not word for word, but the gist, which I think is really mm -hmm. interesting, not from language areas, but kind of from all over the brain. Yeah, that was my question. And, yeah. uh, and they could then decode what they were thinking. Okay. Now, it's idiosyncratic to each individual. I couldn't take like my brain decoder and put it on you. It probably wouldn't work. Although we show share a lot of similarities, but um, I think those. So those are like ways in which the sort of the data reduction dimensionality, what dealing with all that complexity is just helpful, and it's just 
useful, right? So, but I think that um, in other ways, some of the work that we've done, and, and we have a paper uh, in review right now, <clears throat> that records, which we recorded data from thousands of neurons in uh, monkeys. And these monkeys are, rather than being engaged in the task, they're actually just doing monkey stuff with each other. So they're engaged in totally natural behavior, and they engage in like 27 different behaviors, usually in any kind of experiment, it's like one or two different things. And the data on the face of it looked kind of, um, you know, if you look neuron by neuron, which is what you would typically do, it looked kind of boring and not that, like, didn't tell us that much. You take all that data together, the pattern of data across the, you know, and that's thousand some dimensional data, and <clears throat> you do something, we use UMAP, which is one way of sort of dimensionality reduction, and uh, you pack that into three dimensions, and suddenly all of the, that population data clusters into distinct, all those 27 different behaviors. And not just that, but like who that you're was, doing it with, that was exactly and who's question. next to you, you and what's going on. And just you can, so you can, you, so you can. And yeah. so, and it's, you know, it's kind of shocking, but also pretty amazing. And so, you know, I think that maybe what that tells us is that even when dealing with the complexity of the world, which is, is rich and complex, that the brain finds very efficient answers, right? I mean, it's had hundreds of millions of years of opportunity, you know, to do that. And I think that that's what we're seeing. So maybe in the cu last couple minutes we have, could you tell me about the application? Since Michael, I know you teach a course in brain science for business. That may not be the exact title, but it's probably pretty close, pretty close. And Zab, I know you teach a course in visual marketing. That one I know is exactly right. Um, could you guys give me a sense of the big application areas of neuroscience slash AI in business today that you are seeing? Like, what are the ones that excite you the most? Well, I mean, I, I this so my course yeah. is really a, a sort of gateway course. Think of it that way. It's sort of like soup to nuts, everything you need to know, but also like what, are, and somewhat idiosyncratic, what are all the different application areas where I think, you know, neuroscience either is already having an impact or will have an impact. Where it's already having an impact is in marketing, brand strategy. I mean, that is a sort of at this point, point, a no-brainer. If you are not collecting neuro data of some sort, you're leaving high quality data on the floor that could, you would make better ads, you would develop better brands, you'd position them better. We demonstrate that just, you know, over and over and over. So you can turn that crank and just do a much better job, throw away less money. Um, the areas where I think things start to get really interesting and exciting are in places like HR and management, where a more precise, scientific, objective understanding of people, their individual talents, traits, and motivators, right? And what it takes to be really good at, for example, whatever job that they are aspiring to can help to make that match and identify the training, development, et cetera, that can be done to kind of get you from here to there. Uh, so we know companies waste tons of money, tons of time on this, right? Churn is, is huge. Uh, that's frustrating for employees, you know, they're unhappy. So I think it's an opportunity for a win-win. Same thing for teams, right? So what you can do for individuals, it's more complicated in teams, but we can absolutely do that too. Mm -hmm. So Zab, I know you guys have an upcoming conference. I don't know if, the, my guess is this podcast will not necessarily go up before it, but people could obviously, there'll be results from it. There'll be video from it. There'll probably be summaries of it all on the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative website. Um, what's happening at the upcoming conference? It's happening this exact Friday. It is. Um, it's Friday, November 3rd. Um, and uh, this year's uh, theme is on brain capital, thinking about um, all of the cognitive um, skills. And we think about that as, as you know, emotion and creativity um, and, you know, what I think is classically thought of as, as cognition. Like what's necessary actually to equip people to be productive members across the entire lifespan um, and to think about the ways that we can make, maybe devise uh, strategies, economic strategies to, 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 to really leverage that sort of like a, like a lunar mission, but now uh, thinking about cognition. Um, and, and there's actually one segment of the day's programming that's really um, taking a deep dive into this idea that, you know, that AI and human interaction is coming fast, um, and that and that this is really a, a a moment to seize and think about both you know an ethical but also an optimization of what those new teaming structures are going to look like. Um, how how can we really equip um, you know 
the human agent to think about ways to 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 do and live better um, given given this new role of AI uh, that's coming. Uh, but we're also you know we're also diving into other other aspects of of brain development in children and in aging, right? Thinking about the really the brain capital across the lifespan and how like even early childhood ensures better cognitive endpoints, um, more productivity across the entire lifespan, which will help economic um, and productivity and businesses thrive and individuals thrive um, and and probably, um, you know, build better protections for, for mental illness and mental health deficiencies. Hmm. Well, Michael, in the last like 30 seconds or so we have, if we were all sitting here 10 years from now, what are we looking back and saying, whether it's the intersection of AI and neuroscience or AI and humans, what kind of problems do you think get solved in the next 10 years that just we were not capable? Whether it's, as you said, because of more data, better servers, what are the big frontiers in your world over the next 10 years? Yeah, well, I think that we are going to see, <clears throat> hopefully, a lot of today's um, you know issues where brains go awry, right? So like... Whether that's like depression, whether that's uh, you know neurodegenerative disorders, um, whether that's the sort of despair that we see across the population, that we're going to make significant advances in that. Um, a lot of that's going to be technolo technology driven. Uh, AI is going to be a huge um, uh, force for good, I think, in this, in terms of helping us to uh, come up with more creative ideas, right, and help us select amongst those ideas, and then really important for translating them into real solutions too. Well, I'm getting older by the minute, so I'm counting on you. I'm <laughs> counting on you both. So uh, this has been the AI and Neuroscience uh, edition of the AI podcast series here at the Wharton School. Again, I'm Eric Bradlow, Professor of Marketing and Statistics and Vice Dean of Analytics, and I'd like to thank my guests, Michael Platt and Zab Johnson, for our episode today. Thank you. Thanks, Eric.